He has freed us from hell by enduring it. He has fulfilled what the psalmist said, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there also. To start, there's a poem. Uh, it's called The Ballad of the Judas Tree by Ruth Etchells. Maybe you've heard of it. I wanted to start today with, with this. In hell there grew a Judas tree where Judas hanged and died because he could not bear to see his master crucified. Our Lord descended into hell and found his Judas there forever hanging on the tree, grown from his own despair. So Jesus cut his Judas down and took him in his arms. It was for this I came, he said, and not to do you harm. My father gave me twelve good men, and all of them I kept, though one betrayed and one denied, some fled and others slept. In three days' time, I must return to make the others glad, but first I had to come to hell and share the death you had. My tree will grow in place of yours. Its roots lie here as well. There is no final victory without this soul from hell. So, when all condemn him, as of every traitor worst, remember that of all his men, our Lord forgave him first. Whatever you think about hell, the Scriptures teaches us that Jesus went there. Why? To evangelize it. To preach the Gospel, to declare good news to those trapped in its prison, to shut it up, close it down. The St. Peter tells us in his Letter today, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. He descended into hell, as the Apostles' Creed in Rite 1 tells us, so that he might capture it. As John Chrysostom said, hell took a body and it found God. It took earth and encountered heaven. And then in his descent into hell, he has made captivity captive. He's loosed the iron bars and set the prisoners free. Hell is rightly to be feared, but not more than the God who has destroyed it. Sin is to be avoided, but don't forget the God who can forgive it. Death and the end of life can be dreaded but not at the expense of the one who has overcome death and conquered the grave. Jesus descended into hell to capture it, but also to share in our death. He has freed us from hell by enduring it. He has fulfilled what the psalmist said, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there also. Or again, the psalmist says, lift up your head, O mighty gates, as the King of glory enters in to the everlasting darkness with his never-ending light. God became man not just to share our life, but to also share our death so that we who must die can share in his resurrection. So what then is hell? Rather than imagining hell as we often see in popular media as fire and brimstone with a little man, a little red man with a pitchfork torturing us because we committed some cosmic crime, imagine rather, imagine someone who lived their entire life seeking after their own self-interest. Imagine someone who consistently chose himself over others to the detriment of others. Imagine someone who cheated and stole and lied and murdered and oppressed throughout their life. Imagine that person 
standing before Almighty God. What does that person see? What would someone who always chose to see the worst in people expect to see in God? Likewise, imagine someone who was righteous, who did good, who did their duty, who loved, who was kind and peaceable and just, who committed wrongs, sure, but repented of them, who acknowledged their manifold sins and threw themselves at God's mercy. What would that person see? What would someone who always at least tried to see the face of Christ in the other expect to see when face to face with Christ himself? You only love God as much as the person you love the least. And God knows that we are imperfect creatures. He knows that despite giving us the ability to choose well, we might still choose poorly. But the mercy of God is that even when we do choose poorly, even when we sin, grace abounds all the more. But if we refuse to repent of our sins, the grace that erases them and purges them from us will not seem good to us. If we love our sins, we will not love their pardon. I mean, that's hell in a nutshell. It is God forgiving the sinner and the sinner hating God for it. Now, hell is very much a possibility, but it's locked from the inside, as C.S. Lewis said. As Milton described them, they are the, the facile gates of hell too slightly barred. Hell is not so much another place but hell is what heaven will look like to the unrepentant sinner. The wedding feast will taste like pig slop. The lost pearl will look like a rock. The hidden treasure will just be a bunch of junk. And it's not because God is punishing the sinner. God is giving the sinner the same love God gives the saint. But to the unrepentant sinner, he cannot bear it. And because God desires union with us, he must let us choose freely. But when we deny our very nature, the story that God has given us, I shudder to think what we become. But this is what Jesus frees us from. He frees us from the lies that we tell ourselves he frees us from the sin that disfigures us and defigures that, that person on the other side of the mirror. As the new Adam rescues the old Adam, he rescues all of us. He who is God and Adam's son. So Jesus cut his Judas down and took him in his arms. It was for this I came, he said and not to do you harm. So when you find yourself in the same old sins, remember that there is hope to break free from that which destroys you. There is hope to stop. Life in Christ means that we actually are not bound to the same old, same old. But it means that when God says he is making all things new, that includes you as well. As St. Peter reminds us, Christ suffered in the flesh to save you.